Well, good morning, everyone. It's been a lovely uh, experience to be with you this past weekend, get to know some of you and uh, to, uh, uh, just to enjoy fellowship one with another and the foretaste of what heaven's going to be like when we're gathered with believers from all around the globe worshiping our Lord together. So thank you again for uh, having me and for the opportunity of being here. I'd like you to turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 4, please. John chapter 4. And uh, I want to think with you uh, in this session, we, if you kind of think through the weekend, those of you that have been with us on this journey, we, we kind of began uh, really with uh, the book of Acts on Friday night, and we were thinking particularly about the apostles and their commitment to evangelism, that as soon as they had received the Holy Spirit, they went immediately out from the upper room and began to preach the gospel message. And, and uh, we're so glad that they left the security and comfort of that upper room to actually go out to a hostile mob that not long earlier had crucified Christ and bring the message of salvation. We're glad they did that. And then uh, yesterday we spent our day thinking about Paul's instructions to Timothy. Do the work of an evangelist, encouraging Timothy, this timid individual who uh, needed a lot of encouragement, needed a lot of exhortation from Paul. And Paul exhorts him, encourages him, uh, listen, you, Timothy, whether you're gifted or not, you do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. And we, we talked about that. So we've looked at it in Acts, we've looked at Paul's teaching in the epistles. Now I want to think of our Savior, and I want to think of his example as the supreme soul winner, the Lord Jesus Christ. What can we learn from the soul winning work of the Lord Jesus? And as we look at this chapter in chapter 4, I find it very interesting because uh, I, my first time I really studied this in any detail, and Greg will remember this place, there's a place in Ireland, uh, it's called Drewstown House. Do you remember Drewstown House? It was one of these old uh, uh, stately homes, you know, these manor houses, uh, you may have seen some on TV like that, or whatever. It was one of those kind of places that had fallen into disrepair over the years, and a missionary society from the U.S., I forget even the name of the society, anyway, they bought this place and turned it into a camp. And um, I had spoken at the camp there a number of times uh, uh, over the, the eight years we were in Ireland. But on this particular occasion, uh, the, the staff, all the missionaries that worked there, they wanted me to come and speak on the subject of friendship evangelism. And that was the topic I was given. So I began to study the scriptures, and uh, to my surprise, I couldn't find a single example in the Word of God of friendship evangelism. In fact, what I found was every example of evangel evangelism in the New Testament was confrontational of strangers that people had never met before. And so I went there and I said, well, uh, you're in for a shock. <laughs> you really want me to teach what the Bible has to say about friendship evangelism? I said, well, if you want the quick notes, nothing. <laughs> <clears throat> but I said, let me show you what the Bible does teach about evangelism. And I went to John chapter 4 to begin with, and how the Lord Jesus met this woman, had never met her before, even though he knew all about her because of who he is. And the first time he met her, he shared with her her need of living water. Right? First conversation. And so, again, we just need to, we need to think biblically. A lot of books that even become bestsellers are not worth the paper they're written on. They're trash. You're better off reading the Scriptures. And get your convictions and get your, uh, your passion, as it were, directly from the Word of God. You see, if you're involved in friendship evangelism... Where you, you know, the idea went something like this. Uh, you know, you want to become a friend of somebody, and, and eventually, uh, you know, at some point, you'll have the opportunity to share Christ with them. You know, because they'll think you're such a nice person, and eventually they'll say, well, you know, 
wh why are you so nice? And you can tell them, well, because of Christ. The problem is, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. And you don't know when that day it's going to be, right? So you could be trying to kind of win this person over through friendship, and before you even open your mouth to tell them God loves you, Christ died for you, they could have a massive heart attack and be gone. And what good did your friendship evangelism do that? Now, this, is, this message is not a diatribe against friendship evangelism, but it's just to, to show this idea that somehow we've got to think biblically. And one of the, the messages of the Bible is this. Today is the day of salvation. Now, like now, is the acceptable time, right? Not tomorrow, not next week, not three weeks. From, the best time for a person to get saved is when? Right now. Because you're not guaranteed your next breath. By the way, if you're not saved here, I'm not assuming because you're here, you know Christ as your personal Savior. If you're not saved, you know the best time for you to get saved right now. Don't put it off for tomorrow because you may not be alive tomorrow. And, and so there's this sense of urgency of the gospel. Uh, now is the time. Now is the time for you to turn to Christ. So... Uh, as we look at the Lord Jesus as the supreme model of the soul winner uh, in this uh, chapter 4, uh, I want to begin just by reading verses 3 and 4. We're we'll just going to look at individual verses as we go through. Uh, but I, I want you to notice in, in verse 3 it says, He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. So he's making a journey uh, from Judea in the south, and he's going up north to Galilee. And it says uh, in verse 4, and he must needs go through Samaria. Now, if you were just following the direct route, the most direct way to get there would be to go through Samaria. But that wasn't the normal route for Jews. Because the Jews so despised the Samaritans that they would actually cross the River Jordan twice so that they wouldn't be defiled by the Samaritans. They'd literally cross uh, down in the south, go all the way up the other side of the Jordan, and cross over in the north so they wouldn't have to set their feet on that defiled, dirty land where these half-breeds called the Samaritans, you talk about racial uh, uh, kind of prejudice, the Jews hated this. In fact, this woman is shocked that Jesus, a Jew, would even have dealings with her, a Samaritan woman. And so he, he must needs go through Samaria. And of course, the question is why? Why must he go through Samaria? Well, the reason is that he had an appointment <laughs> with a woman at a well. But I want to suggest there's more to it than that, because if you go back to chapter 3 of John's Gospel and verse 16, he made a wonderful, wonderful statement to a Pharisee and a religious leader in Israel, a man called Nicodemus. And you know this verse probably without turning to it, uh, where he says to Nicodemus in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And he is about to demonstrate in chapter 4 just what he meant by the world. Even those despised, hated Samaritans. Aren't you glad that God so loved the world? And by the way, don't modify that word world, please. There are theologians that try to say that it only means the world of the elect. <laughs> if you have to change the Bible to fit your theology, can I make a suggestion? Change your theology, right? It was if you have to change the plain sense of the Word of God to make it fit your schemes, you need to ditch your schemes and go back to the Word of God. I believe when God says, for God so loved the world, that's exactly what he means and then it says that god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son oh what a gift what an amazing gift that 
whosoever. Now, don't modify that. That means exactly what it says. Whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And in chapter 4, he's going to demonstrate for us that the world includes even people we don't like. <laughs> right? Because there are people we don't like, right? Jews didn't like the Samaritans. The English don't like the French. So if you're from a French background, sorry, no offense, but, but they invaded us in 1066, and we've never got over that. We just don't <laughs> like those guys, right? Does God love the French? Yes, he does. He does. He loves the world. Wherever you're from, whatever your background, uh, he loves the world. Whatever your lifestyle may have been. This woman had a very shady history, didn't she? But the Lord Jesus is going to demonstrate his love for the outcast, for the despised, for the hated, for the defiled, for the broken. God so loved the world. Oh, don't you just love that verse? I mean, I could just stop there and just preach on that the whole morning. It's a great verse, isn't it? God so loved the world. But he's going to demonstrate this love for the world by going to this dear woman. And, and so he makes a journey, a journey that was not socially acceptable in his day, a journey that would have uh, indeed incurred a lot of criticism uh, from the religious establishment. And sometimes, if you get serious about obeying the Great Commission, it might make you unpopular with the religious establishment. Because you might have to do some radical things to reach lost sinners. And sometimes the religious establishment doesn't like that kind of stuff. It makes them nervous. And so the Lord Jesus is willing to do all those things. And we're meant to be like him. I want to just show you another place uh, where uh, the Lord makes a specific journey for one individual. Luke's Gospel, chapter 8. If you just turn there for a second, Luke, chapter 8. And again, for another very uh, despised individual. And I want you to notice in Luke 8, verse 22, it says, Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, let us go over onto the other side of the lake, and they launched forth. And of course, the story is that a storm blows up uh, uh, on the sea, sea of Galilee, basically, and, and uh, the disciples are petrified, and the Lord Jesus stands up and tells, where is your faith? And he rebukes the, uh, the wind and, and, and the waves, and, and, and they're amazed, and they, they say in verse 25, uh, what manner of man is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. And the idea is this, is he sets on this, out on this journey to go across to the other side of the lake. It's almost like all of a sudden there's incredible opposition to this journey, right? A storm blows up, and the Lord calms the storm. Mind you, it's an illustration of what he's about to do. He's going to meet a man who's got a legion of demons in him wilder than the wildest storm, and the Lord is going to bring calm and tranquility to that troubled life, isn't he? So it's kind of an illustration of what he's going to do, but it's interesting how there's this kind of opposition. It's almost like, it's almost like something's trying to stop this from happening. And I want to suggest to you that if we go on journeys for the Lord so we might win some lost soul, expect opposition. The enemy does not want people to be delivered from darkness and bondage. So the Lord goes over on this journey. I want you to notice verse 37. The whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear. And he went up into the ship and returned back again. So the point being is this whole journey there and back across the lake was only for one soul. That was the whole point of it. For one devastated soul. The Lord made that journey. By the way, he made another journey, didn't he? A big journey. A journey that left a place of incredible comfort for him. 
He left heaven to come down to this world that hated his father. And he came on that journey especially to reach lost souls like you and me. Oh, aren't you glad that when that council in eternity past took place and the question was asked, Whom sh- who will go for us and who will we send? And, and the eternal Son of God says, Here am I, send me. And my Savior came for rebels and wretches like you and I. And he made a journey deliberately, accomplished the work, and went back again. I'm so glad he did that. And so his concern for souls, and of course the question is, if, if, if we're supposed to be like Jesus, are we prepared to move out of our comfort zone to go where the Samaritan women are, to go where the men of the Gadarenes are, to take the message of Christ crucified, buried, and risen to them? Do we have enough concern to drive us out of our comfort zone. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting how the church is my comfort zone, right? And with people like me, who I like being with, and they seem to enjoy being with me, and we have a lovely time together. The world out there is hostile, right? How are they ever going to hear unless we go out of our comfort zone. I'm glad glad the Lord Jesus left heaven, a place where there was perfect harmony, where he was, everybody loved him and adored him to a place where there'd be rejection, hostility, hatred, but he came. And so we've got to ask ourselves, am I like my Savior? And then, secondly, not only his concern for souls, his constancy in service. Now, the word constancy is the idea of firmness in service, steadiness in purpose and action. In other words, he's determined to do this despite whatever's going on. He's just kind of fixed in his mind that he's going to do this. And I want you to notice what I mean by that in verse 6. If you look in chapter 4, verse 6. It tells us something. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, now we we believe that the Bible teaches that that the Lord Jesus was fully God, 100%. God manifest in the flesh. We also believe that he was fully man, 100%, apart from sin, right? Sin apart. It was, he had no sin nature. But he was fully human. And we sometimes see passages that reveal something of the humanity of Christ. And, and here's one of those passages. He's wearied from his journey. The very same passage you're going to talk about knowing everything this w- woman ever did. Uh, so we're going to learn about the fact in his deity, he knows everything about this woman, every detail, and yet in his humanity. And again, we've got to be careful. I don't want to uh, just take the book. What does it say about the Lord Jesus? And so he's weird. And the point being this, that... Um, not only is he weary from his journey, he's thirsty, verse 7. It's amazing, isn't it? The person that created all the water that is in the world is thirsty. I find that kind of amazing. <laughs> the person that um, is the I am of that burning bush, and you know the picture is that um, like we, we have had a wood fire in our house. And the one thing about a wood fire is that it constantly burns up and you need more. But this bush is constantly putting out energy and is never using up any. (laughs) And here's the Lord Jesus, who in a sense has the energy that keeps the universe ticking over, and here he is, wearied from his journey. I mean, these are things you can't get your mind around, right? And we've said, and I said in the class the other day, that if God was small enough to be understood, he wouldn't be big enough to be worshipped. 
other words, when you look at the study of God in Christ and the Holy Spirit, you still feel like you're just wail- wading in the shadows, right? You just kind of, I mean, like, I, I, I can get so much, I can comprehend so much, but there's a sense in which there's aspects that I just can't wrap my tiny little mind around it because here I am with a finite mind trying to grasp the infinite. <laughs> and it's really difficult, right? Maybe you're smart enough to do it. I don't think you are, though, right? I think all of us are left with a sense of wonder and a sense of awe and a sense of worship because of the greatness of God. And so, so anyway, he's tired, he's thirsty, And I want to suggest to you he's probably hungry as well because it says in verse 8, for his disciples have gone away into the city to buy meat. Why were they going to buy meat? So they could have something to eat. So so the point is very simple. That sometimes when I'm tired and when I'm thirsty and when I'm hungry, the last thing on my mind is some lost soul. You know all I can think about? Getting some food, having a drink, and taking a nap. Right? Like, I need to to relax here now. You know what I mean? I'm really... And yet the Lord Jesus speaks to this woman about her soul in his tiredness, hunger, and thirst. Isn't that interesting? In other words... Some of us, you see, you go do a day's work, and when you come home, you want to get in that easy chair, put the TV on, and zone out, and the last thing on your mind is all those lost souls out there that need a Savior. All you can think about is satisfying my needs. Isn't that that right? By the way, the way we operate even shepherds. One of the difficulties about eldership biblically is because most of our elders do a full-time job, when they come home, our culture says, you owe it to yourself, right? Kick back, relax, you deserve it. And there's the need of sheep out there too that need shepherd care. And a godly shepherd may have to come home, have his supper, and then get cleaned up and go out again after sheep that are beginning to wander astray, right? But the Lord Jesus never asks us to do anything that he himself has not done. You see that challenge? And so sometimes when I feel tired, I get back from a trip and, you know, and, and there's somebody from our assembly calls us, and you know what I want to say? Call somebody else. <laughs> but what the Spirit of God says, is that what your Savior would do? Is that what he would do? No, he wouldn't do that. And so we've got to be challenged, right, of not only making journeys outside of our comfort zone, but also of being so constant in our service that we, we don't be so saturated with our own needs and our own life that we forget about the needs of others. If he was wearied from his journey, this poor woman was wearied because of the effects and ravages of sin in her life. Why was she a weary woman? Five husbands, the one she has now is not her husband. If anybody's weary, she's weary and much in need of living water to bring refreshment to her thirsty soul. I want to think thirdly about what we can learn from our Savior, his conversational skills. One of the wonderful things about the Lord Jesus, and if you want to be an effective soul winner, you have to learn this, and you have to ask the Lord to help you with this. But the Lord Jesus was a master of turning the ordinary conversation into a spiritual conversation. And so this conversation all begins with him asking her in verse 7, there comes a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me 
to drink. And so he begins the conversation at a very basic level. Would you give me a drink, please? And before he's finished, he's talking to her about living waters. He's talking to her about her past history. And he's revealing, he's going to reveal amazing things to her about himself. It's, going to, it's just going to be amazing how he's going to turn this conversation. And we need to pray for that ability. Lord, would you help me like you? And, and of course, the Lord Jesus promised us that help. He said, if you follow me, I will make you, what? Fishers of men. In other words, how do you become a fisher of men? Follow him, and he'll make you a fisher of men, right? Follow him, he'll show you exactly what to do. So he said, Lord, you show me how to do this. Like, I'm not good at this. Oftentimes, I don't know if you've had this experience, oftentimes after you've had a conversation with some unsaved person, you know what, you start thinking, you know what I should have said, I should have said this. And afterwards, I've got all kinds of brilliant ideas. But at the time, so often I'm thinking, I don't know what to say, Right? But the Lord's helping. We're praying about this. We're asking the Lord to help us. So before coming here, I was in Georgia for uh, four weeks. Um, we had a rental house there, and um, the renters moved out, and we were trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, um, which was a challenge. And it took us all of a month, and we had to get workers in to do different things. So anyway, we got this guy in um, to do some brickwork, uh, the front steps had sunk somewhat and uh, they were concrete but there was a brick section and that all got bent out of shape so we got this guy to come and he said to me um, uh, his name was Calvin Blackburn uh, an African American gentleman very pleasant man and and so I said to him I said uh, uh, you have a really interesting name I said Blackburn is a place in England in Lancashire about 70 miles away from where I was born did you know that and the Beatles even mentioned Blackburn in one of their songs. Well, I think, was it 7,000, I don't know, so many thousand holes in Blackburn, Lancashire, or something like that. And he didn't know any of this, so it was interesting. And then I said, you know, your first name is interesting too, Calvin. Do you know what that comes from? They have no idea. And I said, well, there was a French theologian called John Calvin. And he believed that only a, a set number of people could be saved and go to heaven, and everybody else were going to go to hell whether they wanted to or not. If you weren't one of that set number, you had no hope. But I said, let me tell you this, Calvin, I believe that's nonsense. And I believe that you can go to heaven. Would you like to go to heaven? He said, oh, I think about that all the time. We had the most amazing conversation with Calvin just by his name. Another guy came. I had to rent to get pine straw out of the gutters. I had to rent one of these machines that go up in the air. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but uh, it was a, it, you're supposed to balance uh, this kind of a float this way and this way, uh, you know, kind of a, a spirit level. Anyway, one of them was broken, so I couldn't get the thing yet to eyeball it. So I'm up 30 feet in the air. All of a sudden, this alarm goes off, and the machine, machine shuts down. I'm suspended 30 feet in the air, and that's another story for another day. But anyway, ju just to say that the guy uh, who came uh, to deliver the machine, um, <coughs> I was kind of chatting with him and watching him, and, and he was, uh, I watched him when he reloaded the machine on, and he, he does all this chaining stuff. And so I said to him, you know, when, when you do your driving school, do they teach you how to secure the load and do all this work with chains? And, and uh, he, he said, no, he said, I grew up with this kind of stuff, I just know how to do it. And I said, this is really interesting. I said, but you know the Bible talks about people who are going to be in everlasting chains forever and ever? I said, have you ever thought about that? And, and the Lord is, all I'm saying is we need, like the Lord Jesus, to learn how to turn the everyday conversation into something of a spiritual nature we had another guy came and he <coughs> he was um, a, a chimney sweep we had to get the chimney swept before you can we're going to try and sell the house and before you can do that and so I, I said to this guy I said this idea of cleaning the chimney it's really about fire prevention isn't it and he said exactly he said if we don't clean the chimney eventually there'll be a chimney fire and I said you know it's interesting uh, that you're spending your life Stopping people being involved in a fire. Have you ever thought about 
taking means to prevent the fires of hell for your life? And he looked at me and said, I'd never thought about that. See? Now, again, I'm not saying I'm an expert. I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm, I'm just the opposite. What I'm saying is, if you pray, Lord, I want to follow you. And I want to be a fisher of men just like you. And will you give me that skill that you so clearly had of turning the everyday conversation into a spiritual conversation. Because I want to follow you. And I believe the Lord will honor that prayer and will begin to help you. And again, I, let me tell you, I, for years, I would think of this stuff afterwards. I really would. So I'm not saying I'm the number one expert on how to do this. I'm just learning. I'm in kindergarten with this stuff, but the Lord's helping. And it's a wonderful joy because it turns every single little event in life into an opportunity to share the Lord Jesus with others. And what a privilege to be able to do that. And notice, too, uh, that in this conversation, how the Lord Jesus skillfully changes her perception about who he is. And so just notice with me, verse 9, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So her first perception of the Lord Jesus at a very basic level is, you're a Jew. By the way, that means he looked Jewish, right? Uh, he was recognizable as a Jew. He's not a black Christ or any other. He's Jewish. He's not white either. He's not Aryan. Uh, he, he, was, he was a Jew, recognizable as a Jew, right? As, as far as, uh, as, as concerning the flesh, he came of the seed of David and he was Jewish. Yeah, but she, that's all she perceived. But as he began to speak to her about living water, uh, that she wouldn't have to come back to get refreshment, that it would satisfy her forever. In verse 12, she says, uh, Are you greater than our father Jacob? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And so, so her, suddenly her, she's getting a little bit big of you. Uh, are you telling me that you're even bigger than the patriarch Jacob was. Now that's, I mean, he's, he's big in the Jewish religion and in the Samaritan religion, and you're telling me you're bigger than him? Yes, that's what I'm telling you, right? So, so slowly but surely, her conception of who he is is getting bigger and bigger. And eventually, um, uh, verse 19, it says, the woman said uh, to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. So again, it's getting bigger, right? Not only one of the patriarchs, you're, you, you just told me everything ever I did, you see. You, I mean, how do you know about my husband? How do you know I'm really not married at this point in time, that I'm so jaded with bad marriages that this time I didn't even bother? How do you know all that? You must be a prophet. And of course, the climax is verse 29, where she now says, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ. And I want to suggest to you that um, part of our task in evangelism is changing people's perception of who the Lord Jesus is. Because to the average person, sadly in America today, a lot of children are growing up and they don't have any idea who the Lord Jesus is, right? There are a lot of people who have a faulty idea of who the Lord Jesus is, perhaps through cultic influences or false teaching. And so one of our jobs is to point people to the Lord Jesus and to expand their perception of who he is. But in chapter 3, we, we have the very opposite. What the Lord Jesus is doing is not expanding the perception of who he is, but he's actually changing Nicodemus' perception about who Nicodemus is. See, he's a self-righteous Pharisee, and he thinks he's really got it all together. And the Lord says to him, listen, unless you are born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. Never mind enter in. You're not even going to get a glimpse, right? You're, you don't have a hope unless you're born again. And so that gives the other side of it. Part of our job in evangelism is to change people's perception about who Jesus is 
and to change people's perception about who they are. And self-righteous people are still around, aren't they? I was doing door-to-door work in Ireland. And again, the Lord really does give you wisdom at times. But I knocked on this guy's door, and this was in a place called Callan, County Kilkenny. And uh, I, I said to this man, why should God let you into his heaven? And immediately he said, because I am a perfect man, and he should be obligated to let me into heaven. And I was taken back, because most people don't say that. But this guy thought he deserved heaven because he was such a good guy. So immediately I said to him, can I ask you a question, sir? He said, sure. I said, are you married? He said, well, that's got, what's that got to do with anything? He said, well, I wanted to ask your wife if she shared your opinion of how perfect you were. He said, I don't want you to meet my wife. <laughs> and I said, I know why you don't want me to meet your wife, because she knows you better than anybody. And she knows that you're a sinner. It's a great opportunity, you see. And again, the Lord gave wisdom. And, and so we somehow have got to help people see their lost condition and their need of a Savior. We've got to somehow cut away their self-righteousness so that they'll see their need of the righteous one, the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus is perfect in his conversation skills of changing people's perception of who he is and who they are. And that's our job, and he will help us with that. And then uh, in the process of this, he uses these convicting questions, his convicting questions. And of course, uh, verse 16, Jesus said to go call your husband and come here. And... um, <clears throat> we're told sometimes today, oh, don't cause offense and be sensitive. And I don't think we need to be obnoxious. I don't want anybody put off because I'm obnoxious in my character or delivery. But at the same time, um, you, you have to somehow show people that they're sinners, that they're lost souls. And we, we have to know how to ask the right question. And uh, I mentioned the other day about being in Georgia, knocking on doors, and everybody in Georgia thinks they're a Christian. So I would just simply ask them, well, assume I'm not, tell me how to become one. You know, having the right question, which will soon expose whether they really are a Christian or not. Because if they really are, they would be able to tell you how you can become one. And so it's the case of asking the right questions. And again, the Lord can help us with that. Uh, The Lord was good at convicting questions, particularly that would highlight both why she was a thirsty woman and also the fact that she was a sinful person and needed cleansing. And then uh, just uh, as, a, as a final point, his, com- his contentment in doing the Father's will. Look at verse 34. Jesus said to them, this is to the disciples, my meat, the thing that, we could say that really satisfies me is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And I want to ask the simple question, what satisfies you? See, the Lord Jesus says, you know what satisfies me more than anything else is doing my Father's will. I find delight in doing my Father's will. And, and That's the most satisfying thing the Lord Jesus is saying. And so it's good to ask ourselves the question, what satisfies you? Right? What is it that you look to to satisfy you? You know, the Bible talks about covetousness, which is idolatry, the book of Colossians. I don't know if you ever thought about that. You know, our culture, it works on the principle of covetousness, right? He who has the most toys wins, right? Never be satisfied with what you have. You always need the latest gadget, gimmick, whatever, right? And, and God says covetousness is idolatry because we're looking to something other than him to satisfy our heart. And when you're looking to something other than him to satisfy your heart, you are a first-class idolater. Don't want that to be said about me, do you? So the question is, what, where do I get my satisfaction? W- what thrills my heart? 
more than anything else. Is it doing the will of him that sent me? Of course, the Lord Jesus has sent us into all the world, right? Just like he was sent by his father, he now says, so send I you. <laughs> We've been sent, right? With a commission, with a message, with a, with a, with a, a job to do. And he's asking us the question, what satisfies us? <clears throat> so God's plan for your life, and, and it, I can tell you d definitely what God's plan is for your life. God's plan is that he has predestinated you to be conformed to the image of his son. His plan is making you like the Lord Jesus. See, he's so in love with his son, he wants to fill heaven with people just like him. That's what God's plan is. So how can I be like the Lord Jesus? Well, there's lots of different answers to that question. One is, I need to somehow have his character. How can I have his character? Well, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, so on. And that, to me, is a beautiful character, characterization of our Savior. So I'm supposed to be like him because as I depend on the Holy Spirit, Christ's likeness will be part of my life. I, if I want to be like the Lord Jesus, I need to have a zeal for the house of God because the Bible said zeal for your house has eaten me up. Boy, he was consumed with the house of God. We need to be consumed with the house of God. And then if we want to be like the Lord Jesus, we need to have a concern for souls. A concern for souls that will take us outside of our comfort zone. We need to have a constancy in service Preaching in season or out of season, whether it's convenient or whether it's inconvenient, whether I'm tired, weary, whatever, doesn't matter. I just need to be at my father's business. Like the Lord Jesus, we need to have good conversational skills. <coughs> Lord, help me to know how to turn everyday conversations into soul-winning conversations. Help me in asking convicting questions, probing questions that will expose where people are at and that will, will change their perception of you and change their perception of themselves. And then I need to be content with doing the Father's will. That that is what really should light my fire, satisfy me. See, the Father, we were reminded this morning at the Remembrance Meeting, is seeking worshipers. The Son is seeking sinners. And He wants to use us in that process. And you know, when we go and reach people with the gospel, there's more to it than these poor sinners are lost and headed to hell and their life is in miserable because the way of the transgressor is hard and sin is miserable. But there's more to it than that. See, the other side of it is this. They were created to bring God pleasure. They were created to glorify Him. And right now, they're not fulfilling their rightful purpose. They're not bringing pleasure to God because God is angry with the wicked every day. They're not glorifying Him. Their lives are the very opposite. The last thing in their minds is glorifying the Savior. They want to glorify self. So, so they're misfits. They're not doing that which they were made to do. And so it's not just that we don't want them to go to hell. We want them now to live fulfilling the divine purpose for their lives. To glorify the Lord Jesus and glorify God and to bring him pleasure. And isn't it a wonderful thing to be involved in that? I can't think of anything more precious to be involved in than actually putting the world to right one sinner at a time. In other words, through the gospel, seeing people doing the very thing they were made to do. Glorify him and bring him pleasure. And he wants us involved in that. So our Savior, the Lord Jesus, is the most wonderful example of a soul winner. We didn't spend much time in the Old Testament, but one thing it does say in the Old Testament is this. He that winneth souls 
is wise. It's the wisest investment of your time you could possibly involve in. May the Lord encourage us all to do the work of an evangelist, to follow our Savior, the Lord Jesus, and he will make us fishers of men. Let's pray. Father, we just would pray for all of us. We, uh, many of us would, would gladly confess that we're pretty poor at this job of sharing the gospel. Uh, we, many of us have had the experience where we know we should have said something, but we just couldn't think of anything to turn the conversation around to a spiritual conversation. Then afterwards, we come up with all kinds of great ideas. Lord, I just ask that you would help us as we would follow closely our Savior, the Lord Jesus, that you would help us to know how to do this, to enhance our skills in turning the everyday into something of eternal purpose. Lord, if there's one here that has never, ever experienced the living water, transforming power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus, that even this morning they might consider how much he loved them, how much he suffered on their behalf on Calvary's tree so that they should not perish but have everlasting life and that perhaps even this morning somebody would pass from death to life through believing in the Savior. For those of us that have, Lord, again, help us to be effective in sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus with a lost world and we'll give you the glory in our Savior's precious name. Amen.